Uh, I'm Dr. Brad Roberts, Director of the Center for Global Security Research. Thank you for joining us today for a discussion uh, to be led by Dr. Mark Bell from the University of Minnesota on explaining stability in nuclear thinking, grand strategy, nuclear weapons, and policy change. Uh, before introducing Mark, let me just uh, make a brief introduction of the subject. Uh, Dr. Bell's work begins with the observation that states rarely change how they think about the utility of their nuclear weapons. This is certainly true of the United States, where there's a good deal of debate and concern about the extent to which U.S. policy remains trapped in Cold War thinking. It's also clearly true of Britain and France, our nuclear allies. Uh, and, of, and of course, whether it's also true of Russia and China today is a newly important question. Uh, Dr. Bell's work explores why this is so, that is why states rarely change how they think about the utility of their nuclear weapons, even when faced with fundamental changes in their security environments. He's interested in the contrast between the stability of nuclear thinking and the variability of thinking that states show with respect to other military technologies. And his work has important implications for the pursuit of stable strategic relations at a time of erosion in the security environment. Uh, Dr. Mark Bell is an associate professor of political science at the University of Minnesota. His research examines issues relating to nuclear weapons and proliferation, international relations theory, uh, and US and British foreign policy. His first book, Nuclear Reactions, How Nuclear Armed States Behave, examines how states change their foreign policies when they acquire nuclear weapons. He has a bachelor's from Oxford University, uh, a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School, and a PhD in political science from the Massachusetts Institutes of Technology. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. Before turning it over to you, let me remind the group of the ground rules. Uh, Mark will speak for about uh, 45 minutes, then we'll turn to a discussion session. Uh, we prefer that for the discussion, people raise their hands electronically and, and participate uh, in the discussion directly. Uh, and we encourage you to do to raise your hands while the talk is proceeding so that we can launch right into the discussion session. Uh, but if you'd rather not do so, please submit a question in the chat function and I'll, I'll make sure that it gets into play, assuming there's time available. With that, Mark, thanks so much for taking the time to do this with us today. Over, over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the for the kind introduction um, and uh, and for the opportunity to be here. And, and this is very much a sort of a work in progress. It's it's currently sort of an article length project, but but I'm sort of thinking about whether there might be um, potential to to turn it into a book. So I'm really looking forward to uh, to the discussion and um, uh, and feedback. Um, so I'll then move to the next slide. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the origins of this project and and to do a little bit of of sort of shameless uh, self promotion, although um, not not self promotion that will make me much money because the book is available. Um, um, uh, open access and, and free for anyone to, to download. Uh, but this, the project that I'm talking about today really emerged from uh, the first book, which which Brad uh, uh, mentioned briefly, which is about how states change their foreign policies uh, when they get nuclear weapons. And the basic argument I make in that book is that nuclear weapons are actually useful, uh, not just for sort of deterrence in the way that we, we often um, think, but they're actually useful for achieving a broad range of goals in international politics. And states, when they acquire nuclear weapons, are very much aware of this, and therefore they change their foreign policies in pretty significant ways when they acquire nuclear weapons. Right? And in the book, I look at sort of the immediate period after states acquire nuclear weapons and sort of show how states change their foreign policies to take advantage of these enabling effects that nuclear weapons have. Um, but that then leads to a question, which is, how long do these kind of effects last, right? How long do states change their foreign policies and how long do these ideas that states have about the ways in which nuclear weapons uh, can affect their foreign policies last, right? Do you see these sort of brief periods of, of kind of emboldenment of, of, of shifts and then states sort of settle back to, to what they were doing before? Or, which was my hunch, do these effects actually endure over a long period of time? 
Um, so the 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 origins of of the project I'm going to talk about today kind of emerged from this question that was kind of left um, unanswered by 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 my first book. Okay, next next slide. So just to sort of sharpen this puzzle a little bit, if you consider um, the difference between the United States um, and China's uh, approach to uh, nuclear weapons and the way they think about uh, their nuclear weapons. Um, next slide. You know, China and the United States have historically, at least, and we, we can chat about whether this is changing in the Chinese context um, in the Q&A or uh, if folks are interested, but at least historically, China and the United States have thought about the utility of nuclear weapons within their foreign policy, within their grand strategy, very differently. Right? Um, and this is reflected in their very different nuclear arsenals. Right? The United States historically has consistently had a much larger, much more diverse nuclear arsenal uh, oriented much more around counterforce um, targeting, damage limitation and so on, battlefield use. Uh, the Chinese nuclear arsenal, at least historically, has been much more, much smaller, uh, much less diverse, much more oriented around retaliation, counter-value targeting. Right? And both sets of ideas within these two countries have shown remarkable historical stability. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the United States context, um, but suffice it to say that I think the sort of narrative about that emphasizes kind of shifts in U.S nuclear thinking, you know, the sort of standard narrative about, you know, well, there was the, the nuclear monopoly, then there was the move to massive retaliation, then the move to flexible response, then the move to detente and, and, and acceptance of, of mutual assured destruction, I think actually overstates the extent to which things have shifted. I think there's actually a lot more stability. So in sort of social scientific terms, what we see is significant between unit variation, right? Different countries think very differently about their nuclear weapons. Um, but very little within unit variation. Once a country has an idea about how to use its nuclear weapons and how to think about the utility of its nuclear weapons, uh, that tends to endure over long periods of time. That tends to be very stable. And I think this is kind of a puzzle. Um, next slide. This is a puzzle because, as I just said, we do see variation in how states think about the utility of their nuclear weapons, right? There's, it's not the case that there's sort of a single way to think about nuclear weapons that all states sort of eventually converge on. Um, we do see significant variation. Different countries have historically thought about their nuclear weapons in very different ways. And states do reevaluate the utility of other military technologies, the doctrines, where they're recruiting their, their soldiers from and so on, right? We see, you know, that, those kind of reevaluations and policy shifts may not occur as often as we think they maybe ought to. They may not occur consistently, but they do seem to occur more than nuclear, nuclear thinking uh, shifts do. And third, nuclear armed states security environments do change often in fundamental ways. And so if we think about states as sort of responding more or less rationally to, to the pressures of their of their security environments, the lack of of um, re-evaluations and shifts in nuclear thinking is kind of puzzling. So overall, I think we might expect to see far more shifts in nuclear thinking than we actually seem to uh, in the historical record. And so this project aims to try to get a handle on, on why that is and what are the circumstances in which we do see it. Okay, next slide. So my argument in kind of trying to explain this question, and this is still kind of a tentative answer um, that I have. I'm not entirely satisfied with it, so I'm happy to, to receive um, feedback and, and criticisms and, and suggestions, is that there are a range of mechanisms, sort of bureaucratic politics related um, and, and other things as well, that under normal circumstances prevent changes in nuclear thinking from occurring. Right, so there's a whole range, there's a whole bunch of forces basically pushing back whenever anyone uh, tries to significantly shift a country's nuclear thinking. But under conditions of grand strategic change, when a country is fundamentally rethinking its entire approach to the international system, right, its entire sort of approach to creating security for itself, these mechanisms that under normal circumstances frustrate changes in nuclear thinking, those mechanisms are more likely to be overcome. 
right? Under conditions of brand strategic change, everything is, is to a greater extent fair game for evaluation. And under those circumstances, you're more likely to see changes in nuclear thinking. So grand strategic change um, is sort of a, a necessary condition for changes in nuclear thinking. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just to be clear about what I'm talking about when I when I say nuclear thinking, I'm talking about collective understandings among a state's political and military elites about the purposes that nuclear weapons serve within the state's broader grand strategy. Uh, the appropriate weapons and delivery systems needed for nuclear weapons to serve these purposes and the circumstances under which a state would use its nuclear weapons. So this is sort of a broader concept than nuclear posture. It's a broader concept than just nuclear strategy. It includes the sort of intellectual ideas that underpin how a state thinks about uh, the utility of its nuclear weapons. OK, next slide. OK, so. I mentioned that I think there are lots of sort of obstacles to reevaluating states nuclear thinking, right? Where if, if a leader comes into power, wants to significantly shift a state's nuclear posture, fundamentally change the way a state thinks about its nuclear weapons, there are just a lot of obstacles to doing that. And there are a lot of obstacles to shifting policies in general, right, within large government bureaucracies. But my argument is specifically about nuclear weapons. So I focus on uh, nuclear weapons specific sort of mechanisms that I think push back against efforts to, to reevaluate. Uh, so what are those? Uh, so next slide. So first, nuclear weapons, to somewhat different degrees in different countries, but to some extent in all countries, are wrapped in significant amounts of, of secrecy, high levels of classification, significant restriction of who is involved in um, um, the the policy making process with respect to nuclear weapons and for, for obvious reasons, right? Um, but that has the effect of making shifts in policy harder, right? Because fewer people are involved in the process. Those people that are involved in the process are generally sort of invested at least to some extent in the status quo. And they have greater knowledge about the status quo than people outside. Um, the organization. And this presents a sort of power dynamic that makes it fundamentally challenging uh, for any shifts in nuclear thinking to, to be proposed, to win sort of policy arguments within the government, and then to be implemented. Second, those debates um, that need to occur for evaluations and shifts in policy to, to occur are in many cases highly technical. Right, um, they're associated with very specific weapon systems, um, significant um, weapon systems, um, targeting plans, so on. Many of these are, you know, have a lot of highly technical detail associated with them. That makes it a difficult for outsiders to participate in those debates about um, about shifts, shifting policy, uh, shifting nuclear thinking. Uh, but they also provide a tool by which those who have expertise on these issues uh, can use to essentially restrict um, uh, and, and, and sort of uh, place barriers, um, additional barriers, um, to prevent other people from participating in those debates. So the terms of the debate and those participating in the debate tend to be particularly restricted when it comes to, to nuclear weapons. Third, Nuclear weapons, more than other military systems, have high levels of sort of symbolism attached to them and are often deeply ingrained and attached to um, very prominent, very politically powerful national narratives. Right? If you think about the French force de frappe um, and its role within the broader sort of Gaullist narrative of, of French independence. If you think about the role that, that North Korean nuclear weapons play in its own national narrative about uh, self-reliance and so on, right? What that means is that if you come along and propose fundamentally changing the role that nuclear weapons are playing in a state's grand strategy, well, not only are you trying to sort of propose a, a, a new policy subject to all the challenges that, um, you know, any policy shift, um, um, demands, 
but you're also pushing against or subject to being framed as undermining a core component of a sort of national uh, narrative. And that, unsurprisingly, is, is very difficult to do. Fourth, nuclear weapons kind of operate in the background of international politics for the most part, right? Nuclear weapons are very rarely used directly. You know, they're occasionally sort of threatened in various ways, uh, but they generally operate in the background. And therefore, it's very hard to assess the exact role they're playing in any given episode of sort of achieving a state's international goals or failing to. Right. And this, I mean, this was a problem I had when I was writing my, my, my book to try to show that nuclear weapons change states' foreign policies in important ways. Um, but even in, you know, the one case of direct nuclear use we have, right, the U.S. Um, bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right, historians still debate the extent to which this triggered uh, Japanese surrender, the extent to which this mattered relative to the Soviet invasion and declaration of war and so on. So policymakers tend to lack clear evidence that would allow a sort of um, uh, evaluation of policy in the way that we can often get in other areas of public policy, right? And again, this presents a barrier to those seeking uh, to shift nuclear thinking. Finally, ambiguity with respect to exactly what your nuclear thinking is, is at least sometimes strategically beneficial, right? The United States, for example, has various issues on which it maintains a certain amount of ambiguity about whether it might consider nuclear using nuclear weapons, right? Whether in response to chemical attacks, biological attacks, cyber attacks, and so on, right? And if that ambiguity is at least sometimes strategically beneficial or thought to be strategically beneficial, that again makes it harder to reevaluate policies because it's not even clear, for the most part, exactly what the policy even is, let alone what it might move to. So there are a whole bunch of, of obstacles um, that those who seek to shift a state's nuclear thinking have to overcome. And my argument is that under normal circumstances, that is essentially impossible. It's very hard to overcome these obstacles um, that exist. OK, next slide. But under periods of, in periods of grand strategic change, Right when a state is fundamentally evaluating its strategic thinking, then I argue um, it is more likely that you can overcome these forces favoring inertia, and you can trigger changes in nuclear thinking. So if you get changes in grand strategic thinking, you're much more likely to get changes in nuclear thinking. Now, this seems kind of intuitive. I I hope I think. But it's actually in sort of an important way, the opposite of the classic way of thinking about the connection between nuclear weapons and grand strategy, right? If you think about the sort of, you know, the classic theory of the nuclear revolution that, that Bob Jervis and others sort of developed, the argument is basically, if you get nuclear weapons, that should fundamentally change how you think about your grand strategy. That should change how you think about your security. That should change how you think about what it's possible to achieve in your relationships with other states, right? What my argument is saying is that how you think about what what you think about what it your relationship with the international system, what you think about your foreign policy, what you think about your grand strategy actually has effects on how you think about your nuclear weapons. So it's kind of proposing that there's kind of a causal arrow going in in the opposite direction. OK, so how would we know if this this argument is right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the United States. I'm going to talk a little bit about South Africa to try to give us a sort of sense that my argument might have some some plausibility. Uh, to it. So next slide. And what I'm going to look for, I think we should try to look and see if we see three key kind of observable implications of my argument, right? Things that are, if my argument is right, we would expect to see. First, we shouldn't see shifts in nuclear thinking that often, right? This should just be something that happens rarely, if, if at all. Second, when political leaders try to shift nuclear thinking, we should see them being frustrated by some combination of the mechanisms I identified. And third, when we do see shifts, it should be triggered, those shifts should be triggered by prior processes of grand strategic change. Okay, next slide. Okay, so why look at the United States? Well, 
I mean, the U.S. is obviously sort of an important case in and of itself, um, but I think it's also a hard case for my argument, right? There are lots of reasons why we should expect to see pretty regular re-evaluations and shifts in nuclear thinking within the, the United States. And I argue that we, we don't see those and that provides sort of extra evidence for, for my argument. First, the United States has since in the start of the nuclear era seen significant shifts in its security environment, right? The end of the Cold War, right, that Brad mentioned at, at, at the start in his introduction, right? We might have expected that that would trigger fundamental shifts in U.S. nuclear thinking, right? A, a complete change, transformation in the, in the security environment, the international environment that the United States faced. Uh, we've seen regular and pretty significant changes in, in domestic politics within the United States. Right. The United States was also a first mover in the nuclear age, right? So it wasn't as if there were certain ideas out there that the United States sort of conformed to, right? The United States was kind of involved in creating these ideas about how nuclear weapons um, should be uh, thought about. And as I mentioned before, we have this common narrative about that emphasizes over US nuclear history, significant shifts in nuclear strategy, right? The move from massive retaliation to flexible response, then the move to sort of detente and the acceptance of, of mutual assured destruction and, and um, um, uh, the agreement of, of arms control um, agreements with the Soviets, then a move to a sort of countervailing strategy, SDI, and so on, right? So we have this sort of narrative about US nuclear thinking that emphasizes shifts. So is that does that amount to anything, right? Um, so what I'm going to look at in this paper, and I'll discuss briefly some of the evidence, is both just the sort of broad trends in US nuclear thinking um, and also some specific episodes of efforts to stimulate reevaluation and change uh, within uh, the United States. Okay, next slide. So in the broad trend, the broad story um, is that the United States has, I think, had a consistently expansive view of the role nuclear weapons can play in its grand strategy. Um, and that is more important, I think, than any of the kind of shifts we've seen over time, right? The basic questions that you would want to answer to get sort of a, a big picture sense of what the US nuclear posture is like, um, the answer to those questions has remained constant, consistent over time, right? First, do you strive for nuclear superiority or do you are you satisfied with being having an equal nuclear arsenal to, or to other states, right? And the United States has consistently answered that question uh, with a commitment to nuclear superiority. Now that has changed a little bit in how the United States has thought about it, right? Initially, it was very much thought about in quantitative terms, right? Numbers of nuclear weapons. That has shifted at least somewhat to um, a more qualitative understanding of nuclear superiority. Right, the potency of, of the United States um, delivery systems and so on, the particular things the United States can do uh, with its nuclear arsenal. Uh, but the commitment to nuclear superiority, um, I think, has been a constant feature of US nuclear posture since uh, the start of the nuclear age. Second, the United States has consistently been interested in uh, battlefield uses of nuclear weapons, right? And, and what does that mean? It means limited nuclear options of various sorts, right? And again, this is something that, that has persisted over, um, over time. And third, the United States has consistently been interested in pursuing um, efforts towards damage limitation in significant ways. And this has both an offensive and a defensive component to it, right, that, we've, that again, we've seen consistently over time, right, offensively through, through counterforce targeting, right, to take out an adversary's nuclear uh, systems, and defensively, Right through various defensive measures that have again evolved over time, right from sort of civil defense type type measures to, to missile defense and, and so on. Right. So these basic answers to questions about the US nuclear posture um, have remained, I think, remarkably constant over time. And what's more, they're fundamentally rooted in grand strategic goals that the United States has, and particularly the requirements of credible extended deterrence, right? The United States gets nuclear weapons, right? And simultaneously, or, or just afterwards, establishes a whole bunch of 
security uh, relationships with states, right? Commit to defend a whole bunch of states, right? And this is an unprecedented shift in US foreign policy, right? It's a very difficult thing to make credible, right? And part of the way the United States has historically tried to make it credible is with its nuclear arsenal, right? And the answers to these questions, right, and the constancy that they have exhibited over time um, um, is, is sort of uh, a reflection of this kind of stability in nuclear thinking that, that I argue has, has endured, right? And none of these things have changed in the post-Cold War era, right? The United States expansive grand strategy has remained, right? The United States, you know, the extent of the United States defense commitments has, has, has maintained or, or in fact expanded. And therefore, efforts to reform nuclear policy have also failed. Okay, next slide. So one, you know, I mean, there have been various efforts over time to um, shift US nuclear thinking in various ways. Um, but one prominent one that I look at in, in this paper is, uh, uh, comes from the, the Clinton administration effort, right? Uh, so next slide. And this is a case where we might have expected to see substantial shifts in nuclear thinking, right? We've suddenly seen a massive change in the United States international security environment. It's a significantly reduced threat environment. The United States no longer faces any peer competitors. Um, the Democrats control um, Congress and the White House, right? So to the extent that domestic politics might restrict changes in nuclear thinking, right, that should at least have been, have been um, a reduced um, obstacle. The 1993 uh, nuclear posture review was a personal priority of, of Les Aspin, and, and at least in theory, sort of put everything on the table, right? This was designed to be a sort of um, a major review that put a lot of different options on the table that, that potentially would lead to uh, fundamental shifts in, in, in how the United States thought about its nuclear weapons. And Clinton had sort of made a commitment, um, at least made a joint statement with, with Yeltsin, vowing, right, concrete steps to adapt the nuclear forces and practices on both sides to the changed international security environment. Okay. And the prior administration, the George H.W. Bush administration, had actually done a fair amount to sort of lay the groundwork for potentially significant shifts in U.S. nuclear thinking, right, withdrawing. Uh, tactical nuclear weapons from Europe, retiring certain system, reducing alert levels of older missiles, and so on, right? So in some sense, all the stars were kind of aligned um, for a potentially significant shift in U.S. Uh, nuclear thinking. Okay, next slide. So what do we see? Well, not much really happens. Um, and not much really happens in to a significant extent because of some of the mechanisms uh, that I identify, right? The technical nature of a lot of these debates allows military experts um, to override, to preclude the effectiveness, and to thwart um, civilian intervention, right? The administration comes in, a lot of the civilians involved um, are kind of, to at some extent, a little naive about what they're getting into. Um, they think they're going to be able to do a lot more than they are, and the military basically rides rough shots over that process, right? Uh, the involvement of within the, the sort of policy making process of the NPR is 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 pretty limited, right? And this, this quote um, uh, that I think comes from uh, Jan Nolan's book. Um, anyway, someone saying, you know, we certainly weren't about to invite any weirdos from uh, the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency to participate in these, these discussions. Uh, civilians, had a significant informational asymmetry that resulted in a significant power asymmetry within the process. And the desire for ambiguity, right, um, precluded evaluation or even clear statements of policy on various issues, right? For example, on responses to chemical or biological um, attacks. And so what you end up with is actually an NPR that in some ways expands the range of circumstances under which the United States might be prepared to uh, use nuclear weapons, at least under some interpretations. Right. So the metrics for judging nuclear requirements basically remain the same as the Cold War. A new nuclear posture was never seriously considered. 
And so what you see basically is the endurance of previous nuclear thinking, right? And efforts to shift that are, are thwarted, right? Now note here that I'm I'm not making any sort of normative judgment about what the sort of appropriate nuclear posture for the United States should be. And, you know, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not making any claim about what set of ideas were the better ones, right? All I'm making a claim about is that certain ideas endured and they endured partly because of some of the, the, the mechanisms that I sort of uh, point to. Okay, so that's the, the US case, right? A big picture story about um, stability of nuclear thinking, endurance of nuclear thinking, and then specific episodes where the mechanisms I identify frustrate changes in nuclear thinking. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the, the South African case. So South Africa offers in some ways the most unambiguous case of a country reevaluating the utility of its nuclear weapons, right? South Africa built up um, a small nuclear arsenal um, at the end of the 1970s and, and through the 1980s, um, didn't integrate them into its military in a significant way, though it did have a pretty coherent sort of political strategy uh, for how to use those nuclear weapons uh, to extract political benefits, uh, particularly from the United States, should the Soviet Union, um, uh, should Soviet involvement in Angola uh, particularly escalate um, during the United States, right? South Africa was involved in a in a in a conflict in Angola, um, and but at the end of the the nineteen eighties, the start of the nineteen nineties, South Africa basically gets rid of its nuclear weapons. It does this in in secret initially, and then it announces uh, in nineteen ninety three that it's that it's done this. And there is a common belief that essentially racism drove this decision, right? That the apartheid regime knew the end was kind of coming. I knew it was going to have to give up power to Nelson Mandela and, and the ANC. Um, and it basically didn't want the ANC or an ANC controlled government to have nuclear weapons. Right. That's sort of the, the standard narrative about, about South African disarmament. So again, this should be kind of a hard test for my argument, because I argue that, that it's really grand strategic change that 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 should be driving this, this shift in nuclear weapons. OK, so what do we see? Uh, next slide. Uh, so that's F.W. De Klerk, the sort of reform-minded um, South African leader who initiated the effort to, to give up uh, its nuclear weapons. Uh, next slide. So what I find, and, and I spent a bunch of time a few years ago interviewing um, sort of apartheid-era military and political elites in South Africa um, for, my, for my first book, um, I actually think that, that grand strategy was the driver. What happened um, was that the threat from the Soviet Union in Southern Africa dissipated. Right? And this triggers South African elites to seek, right? Their security situation has improved. What they now want to try to do is improve their financial situation. South Africa is a pariah nation, right? For obvious reasons, the sort of um, horrific uh, nature of its domestic political institutions, the exclusion from political power from the, of of the majority of the population. And so South Africa is under huge sanctions, huge array of sanctions from the international community. And this is crippling South Africa's, South Africa's economy, and they want to try to figure out a way to get out of those sanctions. What they realize, South African elites, white elites, apartheid era elites, is that this is gonna require a fundamental change in their approach to both internal and external security. Right. They realize that the only way they're going to get some of these sanctions taken off is if they reform domestically and shift how they're engaging with the international system. Right. So one um, senior um, South African uh, person involved in the, in the nuclear program recalls um, F.W. de Klerk saying when he came into office, you know, in my term of office, I'm going to take South Africa back to being a respected member of the international community. And this had basically two components. It means we're going to unban uh, Nelson Mandela and the, and the ANC. We're going to release him from jail. Um, and we're going to begin dismantling apartheid policies. And we're also going to accede to the MPT, right? So 
grand strategic change in this argument, right, led to both domestic and nuclear policy changes, right? But note that at this point, South African white elites had not um, sort of come to terms with the fact that they were going to have to give up power. They were still anticipating or hoping for a future in which they held a certain amount of power. So this was not about um, sort of preventing an ANC government from having nuclear weapons. It was a, it was a very sort of cold strategic um, argument about what it would take to get the international community off their back, essentially. But in this period of grand strategic change, the utility of nuclear weapons was no longer taken for granted, right? And once it's no longer taken for granted, South Africa actually makes the decision pretty quickly and pretty easily to freeze the nuclear program and then subsequently dismantle it, right? South Africa accedes to the NPT then in 1991 and then reveals its nuclear weapons program in 1993. So what we see, therefore, is that this grand strategic change drove um, a fundamental shift in how South Africa sort of conceived of the utility of its nuclear weapons. OK, next slide. OK, so just to just to wrap up and, and then I look forward to the to the uh, discussion and, and any questions. Uh, but the empirics basically support the historical record supports the kind of theoretical argument here, right? Shift in nuclear thinking occur rarely. In the absence of grand strategic change, um, uh, the, the mechanisms I identify tend to stifle innovation, reevaluation, shifts in nuclear thinking. And grand strategic change occurs as a prerequisite for shifts in, in nuclear thinking, right? So it's a necessary condition for shifting uh, nuclear thinking. Okay, next slide. So there's some sort of um, implications for those of us who sort of think about uh, international relations theory and how, how nuclear weapons sort of affect international politics right here. Grand strategy is driving nuclear choices, not the other way around, right? So the, this is another kind of challenge to these kind of classic ideas relating to the nuclear revolution, right? And is consistent with some of the more recent challenges to those um, those ideas that emphasize the very kind of political nature of nuclear weapons, right? Nuclear weapons are not just this technology that sort of fundamentally shifts, or changes international politics, states grand strategy. States grand strategy and those political choices about how states want to engage with the world, what they think they can achieve in the world, how they think about getting security in the world, affect how the states how states think about their nuclear weapons and what they use nuclear weapons for. Second, um, there's this kind of common idea that nuclear learning is sort of an important phenomenon, right? That countries, um, you know, acquire nuclear weapons. They try to use nuclear weapons in a bunch of ways. There's sort of this period of danger after a country gets nuclear weapons when they're sort of emboldened and they're trying all sorts of things, but that they ultimately settle down into kind of stable patterns of, of deterrence. They understand that nuclear weapons are only really good for deterrence and nothing else. I think that's that argument is wrong. Um, and it's wrong partly for the, the reasons uh, laid out here. A, nuclear weapons are, in fact, useful for a whole bunch of things, and states know that and, and, and adjust their foreign policies accordingly. Um, but also, these ideas endure over time, right? States don't simply sort of learn over a couple of year period um, and sort of adapt their behavior. Um, they they acquire nuclear weapons. They figure out what they're useful for, how they can use them to advance their foreign policy goals, um, and those ideas endure for long periods of time. Right. So nuclear learning doesn't really occur in the way that that some people think. Uh, what implications does this have for policy? Uh, and so I'll talk about a few sort of very kind of big picture policy questions that this this has relevance for. Uh, next slide. First, you know, potential shifts in U.S. nuclear thinking, right? Is, is it possible that the United States might shift its nuclear thinking in, in significant ways, move to a you know, no first use declaration, a sole purpose declaration, right? Shift its targeting um, in ways to, to, to uh, place less emphasis on counterforce, for example. 
And the argument of this is, my argument is, is, is probably not, right? And absent some major shift in US grant strategy, right? US grant strategic change is likely required before a big shift in US nuclear thinking is, is likely. Uh, second, is North Korean nuclear disarmament possible? Well, I mean, yes, in the sense that countries can fundamentally shift uh, their nuclear thinking if their grand strategy shifts, right? But North Korea is not going to shift its nuclear thinking in significant ways absent that grand strategic change, right? And it's certainly not going to do so in response to sort of vague promises of a better relationship with the United States, right? This doesn't mean that, you know, deals between the United States and North Korea um, are impossible. I actually think there are various deals that, that might be possible between the United States and North Korea, um, but they're not going to involve North Korean disarmament absent um, a major shift in, in North Korean grand strategy. Um, and then third, and, and an issue that I sort of mentioned briefly earlier, right, how might China's nuclear thinking shift in the future? Well, China has, has at least historically and is in the process of changing, though, um, an unusually small nuclear arsenal um, with quite a distinctive nuclear posture, right, that emphasizes sort of retaliation uh, rather than first use. Um, and has traditionally, historically, um, viewed the utility of, of its nuclear weapons in a pretty limited way, right? They're a sort of, they're an insurance policy to prevent nuclear coercion and nuclear attack, right? But what my argument would suggest is that if Chinese grand strategy becomes more ambitious, its nuclear thinking may shift as well, right? What would that mean? Well, it would likely mean a larger, more diverse nuclear arsenal, greater emphasis on nuclear weapons within its grand strategy, um, greater emphasis on the potential use of nuclear weapons earlier within a crisis or conflict, right? And given ongoing Chinese investments in its nuclear arsenal, right, the question is whether we're sort of starting to see that process kind of kind of occurring. And I think maybe maybe we are, right? That we're seeing shifts in in Chinese nuclear thinking being driven by shifts in Chinese grand strategic uh, thinking. Okay, so I will uh, I'll stop there. Um, I look forward to um, comments, suggestions, criticisms, uh, questions, and thank you again for for the invitation and for the opportunity to to speak with you all.